I want to invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, we are going to tackle uh, what I believe might be one of the most difficult passages I have ever preached on in the New Testament. Uh, if you look, if you were to type in Google or a search engine on the internet, uh, most controversial text in the New Testament, this would be toward the top of the list. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. But I want to tell you something I'm very excited about, is I feel like through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom and understanding uh, that He allowed me to get a grasp on it. Uh, and it all started two weeks ago when I had to change my personal interpretation of the end of chapter 5. So if you weren't here last week uh, and you're visiting with us, we walk verse by verse through the Scriptures. I've had the privilege of preaching through many New Testament books uh, on Sunday mornings in the 13 years of being the pastor here, and, and we're in Hebrews now. If you weren't here last week, you need to go back and listen to that message. It's on YouTube. It's, it'll be on our website. Go and listen to it because it lays the groundwork for what I'm about to share with you out of verses 4 through 6 of Hebrews 6. And I also want to share with you, I enjoy teaching a lot more than I enjoy preaching. I've had a lot of people come up to me over the last uh, 10 or 15 years and say, you're more of a teacher behind the pulpit than you are a preacher. And the reason I feel that's appropriate is because the time that I spend in the pulpit is equipping and training time for the body of believers. It's not uh, an opportunity for uh, only evangelism, although that happens every time the Word of God is preached accurately. Uh, but I believe it's a time to equip you so that you can go out there and be who God has called you to be. Uh, so today is going to be no exception to that. Today is going to serve two purposes. Uh, purpose number one apologetics, which means knowing what you believe, why you believe it, and giving you the resources to defend it. All right, so you're going to receive that today against the, the false teaching that a man can lose his salvation or a man can fall from grace. You're going to be equipped today from the scriptures of how to counteract that because we find ourselves at one of the very passages that gets most commonly used to produce that kind of teaching. But the other purpose for today is the warning that was intended when the writer of Hebrews wrote this text. We want to receive that warning as well. Uh, so we will do that as we look at it. Uh, so just as a, a brief recap, last week we established that Hebrews 5 verses 12 through 14 is contrasting unbelievers who have a false profession with true born-again believers. So when you hear about someone who has been taught the doctrines of the gospel over and over and over again, yet, yet they still need to be fed milk, that is a person who has never been converted by the gospel. And then the one who has received that teaching and applied it to their lives and it has begun to affect everything about them, that is a person that has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we're contrasting an unbeliever and a believer, not a, an immature believer and a mature believer. The reason we need to nail that down over and over again is that is a necessary interpretation in order to avoid a major contradiction when you get to chapter 6. Because if you think that the end of chapter 5 is contrasting two types of believers, then you would be guilty of falling into the trap that Hebrews 6 is talking about someone who was once a believer and no longer is. We know from Scripture that cannot be true. Uh, Hebrews 6 is referring to an unbeliever who has rejected the truth after it has been presented to them multiple times, uh, not a believer who has fallen away from that truth that they once had faith in. Uh, we're talking to the group of people that have been intellectually convinced that Jesus is who he says he is, but they've never surrendered their life to him as Savior and Lord. Uh, the reason this is so crucial to interpret it this way is because uh, we would run into a major fallacy and a major contradiction in Scripture uh, if we didn't do so. There's multiple fallacies in using this passage to prove that one could lose their salvation. And one of the main ones, 
And you don't ever hear this being taught. You don't ever hear this combo staying together with someone who tells you you can lose your salvation. Is if, if Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, is teaching that a man can lose his salvation, then it also is teaching he can never get it back. So think about that. I want to uh, read the text today. And I want you to have that in your mind as we begin to, to dissect these verses and further emphasize that this is speaking of someone who has never been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, so if you have your place at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, I want to invite you to stand if you are able. And I'm going to read the text that we're going to be dissecting this morning. Beginning in verse 4, it says, For it is impossible... For those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Father, as we walk through this passage today, may your Holy Spirit grant us wisdom and understanding, deepen our convictions, deepen our ability to defend our faith when it is attacked by false teachings. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So one of the main fallacies with viewing that this is teaching you can lose your salvation is that you would also have to accompany that fallacy with, once lost, you will never obtain it again. Because it says, if they fall away, they will never again be able to be renewed to repentance. Uh, so we, we don't hear that combo preached. But Scripture is clear that once a person is truly saved, they are saved for eternity. And I want to just give you uh, three passages here and then one fourth one that's from the book of Hebrews. Uh, so just listen to these words. John 10, verses 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Amen? Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-5. through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now listen to this. To attain an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. To think that a person can be snatched out of salvation is to think that there is something in existence that is greater than the power of God that saved you in the first place. And there's nothing greater than the power of God. Then in the letter that we are studying, Hebrews 10, verse 14 says, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. If the process has begun in them, that process will continue into eternity because of the one sacrifice that Jesus Christ paid with his own life. So it's obvious that the people of Hebrews 6, with taking a holistic view of Scripture, 
and even an accurate view of chapter 5 and chapter 6 that this is referring to unbelievers. Verses 1 through 3 of Hebrews 6 can be summed up as leave the things, because the, the audience is Jewish in this letter, leave the things you have been placing your faith in and come to the Christ who those things are pointing to. Leave the, the things, the, the rituals and the ceremonies and the feasts that, that you have been doing to point you to Christ and actually come to Christ who is the author of our salvation. We do need to deal with the language of verses 4 through 6, though, so that you are equipped when you face someone who is trying to use these three verses to prove that you can lose your salvation. I want to share with you the meaning of each of these words so that you can say, no, that's talking about someone, if it's possible, to get right on the edge of salvation without uh, belief in Christ, then this, this is the category that we're talking about. These are people who have been given all of the necessary ingredients uh, of salvation, of the gospel. They've heard everything that is necessary to receive Christ as Savior, yet they reject Him. Uh, So I want to show this to you. There's actually five things mentioned in this warning of verses 4 through 6, giving us the caution, do not turn away from the gospel. It is a dangerous place to be. So the first of the five is in verse 4. It's impossible for those who were once enlightened. What does it mean to be enlightened? Who were once enlightened, speaking in past tense. The word enlightened means to have come to a perception of the truth, but only intellectually. So when this word enlightened is used in Scripture, it's talking about the mind. Your your mind has been illuminated to the truth of the text. You have been shown that what is being said is true. Uh, The Apostle Peter spoke of this enlightenment in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, when he writes, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge... Now that knowledge there is the enlightenment through the head knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. And look at verse 21. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. What Peter's warning there is, a person who is presented with all of the evidence of the saving gospel and then walks away is going to suffer a a more uh, extreme fate than the person who was never presented it before. Now, we do have to address something here. Uh, That does not mean, because this is another false teaching that you will encounter. Uh, Someone would say, Will that person out in the middle of the jungle in Africa, I'm just, I'm just making up a, a geographic location, but that person who's out in the middle of the wilderness where there's no civilization, who has never heard the gospel and has never heard the name of Jesus Christ mentioned, if that person dies, will they go to heaven or will they go to hell? And in our compassionate minds, we would like to think that someone like that would go to heaven. But if that were true, there would be two ways to heaven. Way number one, through trusting in Jesus Christ. Way number two, having never heard of him. That can't be true. Jesus is the only way to heaven. And if that were true, then we need to stop all missionary efforts. Because if you go to that unreached person and you share the gospel with him, you just messed up his destiny if he rejects what you share with him. So there, there's, fault, there's falsehood and fallacies in believing that way. And, and that's a misunderstanding of the guilt of man's sin to say, I'm not going to hell because I never heard the gospel. I'm going to hell because I'm a sinner who has violated God's law. And God cannot be in the presence of sin. So therefore, I need Jesus. 
which that further motivates missions. We need to get the gospel to them. So back on track, that was a a rabbit trail. This highlights the tragedy of having the intellectual knowledge. The, The enlightenment is having the intellectual knowledge of Jesus Christ in your head without having the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ in your heart. One who was once enlightened. The second statement that is made about this group of people in verse 4 is that they have tasted the heavenly gift. The heavenly gift is a reference to salvation. They have tasted the gift of salvation. Now some people think that this is evidence of a person losing their salvation because they compare the verb tasted with how it was used in Hebrews chapter 2. So let's do that. Let's compare the verb tasted with the way the writer has already used it. Go to Hebrews chapter 2 and look at verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. Same word. We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. So let me tell you the meaning of this verb tasted in the way that the writer of Hebrews is using it, both in Hebrews chapter 2 and in Hebrews chapter 6. This is referring to someone who has experienced or tasted the reality but have not encountered the total experience. So they've They've tasted the reality of something without encountering the whole experience. How would that apply to Jesus Christ? He tasted the reality of death, but did not experience the totality of it or the eternal nature of it. What did he do? He resurrected again three days later. So we say he did not fully experience all that death has to offer, but he did taste it for three days. All right, well, let's apply that same mindset to what's being tasted in chapter 6. We would say that they tasted the heavenly gift, but did not fully experience the eternal nature of it, all that it had to offer. Uh, If that's not enough for you to understand the difference of tasting and fully experiencing, then this same concept is used in Christ's analogies in John chapter 4, And in John chapter 6, John chapter 4, he refers to himself as living water. And he says, come to me and and taste. No, he says, come to me and drink. Right? And and then in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. He does not come to say, come to me and nibble or come to me and taste. He says, no, come to me and eat. Come to me and consume. That this would be a a total experience. And I'll show you one other Uh, argument for that when we get to the fourth statement of tasting the word of God there's a contrast there as well a difference between simply sampling it and consuming it uh, is is the difference that the writer of Hebrews is using here so number three about this group of people not only have they uh, been enlightened in their minds and have tasted the heavenly gift they they know what it looks like and what it sounds like they've tasted it Uh, And they've experienced the presentation of it. But they have also become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Now this can be a little bit uh, confusing. If you don't understand uh, the verb that's translated here, partakers. The Greek word that's used for partakers means association, not possession. So if we accurately interpret that, then here's what that would mean. They have been exposed to the works of the Holy Spirit. They've watched him work around them, but he has not worked in them. They haven't truly experienced that internal ministry of the Holy Spirit that only believers experience. They've been in the presence of the Holy Spirit's working in others, but have never fully experienced it for themselves. Which brings us to the fourth characteristic Uh, given to us in verse 5. They've even tasted the good word of God. If you go back to chapter 5, verse 12 and 13, they've tasted the good word of God enough to even teach it themselves. So we're talking about an exposure 
to the teachings of the scriptures. They've sat under the teachings, but simply tasting it would be contrasted with what we have like in Jeremiah chapter 15. Listen to this experience with the word of God. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. That's the difference between tasting and consuming. James would tell us that someone who tastes it is one who receives the teaching and walks away unaffected. And then he would tell us, because if they were affected, it would come out in their lives. To be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Don't be like a man who looks at and observes himself in a mirror and then walks away and quickly forgets the things that he has been shown. There's a difference between tasting and consuming. And then we get to the fifth one that's mentioned. Uh, and this is mentioned at the end of chapter, verse 5 where uh, the writer says, They have even tasted the powers of the age to come. This is likely a reference to the ministry of the apostles because this church of Hebrew Jews was planted by the apostles themselves uh, in history uh, outside of Jerusalem. And so they have, they have witnessed firsthand the ministry and the miracles of the apostles, which is a taste of the powers of the age to come. Which brings us to verse 6. If they have been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, become partakers by association of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God, and have tasted the powers of the age to come, but they have fallen away from those five experiences, then you got to go back and borrow the word from verse 4. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So we got to go back and look at that word impossible. Because I've even seen where some people have modified what this word means in order to get this text to, to teach that you can lose your salvation. Uh, this word has been interchanged in some teachings with the word difficult. How could someone never be able to return to the saving power of the gospel. And so they say, it must not truly mean impossible. It must mean difficult. Well, I want to use scripture to help us understand the word impossible because this word gets used four times in Hebrews. All right, so right here. Now go to verse 18 in this same chapter. Go to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. And I'm going to try to do this interchange with you and, and you see for yourself for by two immutable or unchanging things in which it is difficult for God to lie. That wouldn't fit, would it? No, it is impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Now go to chapter 10 and look at verse 4. It's the third use of that word. For it is not possible, impossible, that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. We, we wouldn't put there that it is difficult for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. No, we would say it is impossible. There's only one blood that can take away sins. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ. So that interchange doesn't work there. And I go to the last one. Go to chapter 11 and look at verse 6. For without faith, it is difficult to please God. No, I would imagine that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so if we can't make that swap in any of the other three locations, then we can't make it here in chapter 6 when the writer says, it is impossible for someone who has experienced these five things and yet walked away from it. To restore them to repentance. Now there's, there's something else I need to show you. And this is, I'm very, I'm very excited about what I'm about to say. This is where I have been enlightened this week. 
in my own understanding, and, and get ready for this, that verse 6 may not even be talking about salvation. All right? Let me tell you why. The verb renew, translated in the ESV, is restore. What do you do when you restore something or renew something? You put it back to a state that it had been in previously. Who are we talking about here? Are we talking about people who were once saved and now they're not, so they need to be restored to being saved? No, that doesn't match the rest of the text. So what do they need? What can they not be renewed to? Go all the way back to verse 11 in chapter 5. What has happened to these people? They have become dull of hearing. They no longer passionately, eagerly, and with an interest receive the teachings of the Word of God. It's kind of like a vaccination. How appropriate it is to talk about that, right? It's kind of like a vaccination. How does a vaccination work? It gives you a little bit to help you form a resistance to the whole thing. So what happens to someone who sits under teaching after teaching after teaching? They build up an immunity to that which they're being taught. They're losing a sensitivity to it. There's a hardness and a callous that's forming because they've received all this information and done nothing with it. That's why the writer of Hebrews is warning you, if this is describing you, you are on dangerous ground. So we can't interpret verse 6 as restoring someone back to salvation if we've interpreted all the previous verses as they've never been saved. Instead, verse 6 is referring to restoring them back to that freshness, that eagerness, that newness, that interest that they once had that drew them to the teachings of the gospel. Why why were they in this church that the writer's writing to? They're there. They're not saved. We have unsaved people in our church. Why are they here? It's because there's there's still something piquing their interest. Or either their parents are just making them come, right? There's still something piquing their interest. Well, there's going to come a time where it doesn't pique their interest anymore. And when they get to that point, it's, import, it's, it's impossible, not difficult, it's impossible to get them back to those fresh ears that they once had when they would hear the teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've neglected to come to Christ. They've walked away from the only saving gospel. There's no other message you can give them. I want you to see where I'm going with this to a danger that many churches are falling prey to today. There's no other message you can give them. There's nothing you can tell them that they haven't already been told. There's nothing you can show them that they haven't already been shown. And the writer is basically saying, there's nothing else we can give them if they walk away from the truth after it has been clearly presented to them. They've been enlightened. They've tasted it. They've seen it, they've experienced it, and they still walk away. Here's what many church leaders and many churches are doing today with this category. They're changing the message in order to get them back. Let me tell you the danger in that. If you reach them, this group of verses 4 through 6... And if you don't hear anything else I say today, I want you to hear this. If you reach them with a false gospel, you reach them to a false gospel, and their eternal destiny will be the same as if they had continued to stray. I want you to hear that. If you change the message in order to draw them back in, then what you are reaching them with will not save them. They've turned away from the only true message. Our job is to present the gospel to them. We can't save them. But if they've been given all of the evidence and it has had no effect on them and they have become dull of hearing, it no longer is accompanied with passion. It no longer is matched with interest. 
and they walk away from it and reject it. There's nothing else you can say to that person to get them back to that state. You say, but preacher, it says in verse 6, repentance. It says if they fall away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Isn't that talking about salvation? I'm going to tell you, a person can temporarily repent and not be saved. What do they do when, they, when someone hears afresh the teachings of the gospel and they get surrounded by people who believe in that gospel? They modify their behavior, right? To match the group that they're with. But that's only going to last for a short period of time. There's going to come a time when they stop modifying that behavior because it's too much work for them. That's why perseverance provides the evidence of true salvation. Because it will endure to the end. James 2, 19, or no, 1 John 2, 19 says, By them falling away, they gave evidence that they never truly had the real thing. They were so drawn at one time that they modified their behavior. By falling away from the truth, and this was a little bit hard to interpret, but I think I got a handle on it too, uh, end of verse 6. They have crucified again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. So it's almost like, now get this, I, I can help you interpret the end of verse 6. It's almost like, they went all the way back through the trial process that Jesus was put on in the first place and they reached the same conclusion. Think about it. Give me all the evidence that Jesus truly is the Messiah and it was given to them. They surveyed the evidence and they said, no, I believe him to be a liar. He's not the Messiah. He's not the Savior. Crucify him again. They put him on trial, they tested the evidence, and with their own rejection, they've crucified again the same fate and, and have joined the crowd that, that rejected him. They crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. What's the open shame? These are people who have gone to church, they have modified their behavior, they have professed to believe what everybody else in the church believes, and now shamefully they have turned from it saying it's all a lie. They've surveyed all of the evidence and have aligned themselves with those who crucified Jesus by finding him guilty, rejecting him as the Messiah. Now, verses 7 and 8 go with this part of the passage. There's a transition between verses 8 and 9, uh, given with that transitional word. But uh, we shift gears and we begin focusing on the believers in the church, whereas 1 through 8 was focusing on the unbelievers. So I do want to go ahead and tack verses 7 and 8 on the end of today's teaching. So let me read those to you. It says, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. So we know that when rain falls on the earth that it waters crops, crops grow, produce fruit. So the, the earth benefited from that rain. But we also know when rain falls on the earth it waters weeds. Right? Everybody agree with that? And so, verse 8 says, if the earth bears thorns and briars, then those thorns and briars are rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So we, we have to understand that when the gospel, and I'm going I'm to help you see this even more clearly in the teachings of Jesus in just a minute, but we have to understand when the, when the gospel is rained down upon a group of people, there are some that will receive that cultivation and will rise up and produce fruit. Those are ones who have been watered and nourished by the gospel. But then there are also those that will rise up and be identified as briars and thorns and thistles. And those are those who rejected the gospel. So go to Matthew chapter 13. Jesus used this exact same analogy. Matthew chapter 13, look at verse 3. Then Jesus spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. 
And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns. And the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. How many of these categories were saved by the gospel they received? One. Drop down to verse 18. Jesus describes this parable. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. There's that enlightenment and that tasting. Verse 22. Now he who received seed among the thorns... Is he who hears the word, he tasted the teachings of the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Verse 23, but he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty and some 30. This is the group that the writer of Hebrews is about to address in verse 9. The group that was actually changed by the message that they received. Which causes us to look at this warning today and ask the question, which category am I in? Because every one of us here this morning have sat under the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What effect has it had on you? Because let me share with you. If you find yourself coming to church week after week after week and reading your Bible day after day after day, yet you feel your passions decreasing, you feel your interest dissolving, you are in a very dangerous place. There's hardness forming. There's calluses forming. There's a lack of interest that will lead to a falling away. And when that happens, you will never again be renewed to a sensitivity to the gospel like you were when you heard it the first time. So what's the warning there? When you receive the message of Jesus Christ and the the plan of salvation, the the sufficiency of his sacrifice and him being the only way to heaven. Place your faith and trust in it. Don't let it just be head knowledge. Surrender your heart to the message of the gospel. I want to end with this statement because I think that we as believers sometimes read texts like this and we, we falter in our application. I think that And I've even encountered some teachers who lean too heavy on this text helping us diagnose people who are in this category. Let me tell you what I think we ought to do with this text. This text needs to be a stern stern warning not to be in this category. You understand? This is not equipping us to walk around going, he's unreachable. That one's gone too far. No sense in wasting time with him. No, it's to say, when I see somebody who is repetitively under the teaching of the gospel and there seems to be no effect on their lives, I need to be begging and pleading the Lord, save this person. And I need to be sharing the gospel with this person. Not changing the message, but seeing the stern warning of where that person is headed. And what a dangerous place that is to be. Don't turn away from the truth. 
And don't change the truth to simply keep someone from turning away. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your wisdom and understanding that you pour out upon us when we, as believers, spend time in your word and and your Holy Spirit ministers inside of us to grant us wisdom. We know that that wisdom is from above. I pray, Lord, today that your church has been edified as we've walked through this text and, and that you have deepened our security in our own salvation but also that you have equipped us to stand on the truths of Scripture, not to be influenced by false teachings. That there are more than one way to heaven or that that a person can lose their security in Christ after obtaining it. Lord, we didn't play a part in gaining our salvation, so we certainly can't play a part in keeping it. That security rests in you alone. So today I just, I pray for those who have truly surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ that you would uh, deepen their understanding of why they believe what they believe and give them the resources necessary to stand on truth and defend it when challenged. But I also pray for those who have sat under the teachings once again this morning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, that have yet to surrender their hearts to it. Lord, please do not let them turn away. Please do not let them become dull of hearing and to fall away from a a, a sensitivity to the gospel never to be renewed. We desire for them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and to be transformed inwardly by your salvation. May you do that work in their hearts today through your Holy Spirit and draw them unto yourself. And may we just get to glean from that ministry of receiving them and them making it known to us that they have made that commitment. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the gospel. Help us to stand boldly on truth, unwilling to compromise. Because we know that what we win them with is what we win them to. And we only want to win them with the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for saving me with that gospel. And equipping me to share it with others. As we sing this closing song to you, Lord, may we sing it out of a heart that desires to be Uh, refreshed in our passion to live in the gospel and to share the gospel, the true gospel. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.